Today we have an opportunity to start a new series. You can see the graphic behind me, a series called Together, The Anatomy of Community. We're going to talk about what it looks like to be in community. And every year around this time, we have our Grow series. We have our mission of our church, making more and better disciples who learn, grow, and serve. And in the fall, we have a Learn series. And here in January, we have a Grow series. And so this is the Grow series. It's going to be a little bit longer than I usually do for a Grow series. It's going to be for eight weeks. So starting today, including today for the next eight weeks, we're going to talk about community. And I want to really ground this in the Scriptures. We're going to be in a few different places in the Scriptures, not in just one book, uh, which is a departure from the norm around here, because we usually preach through books of the Bible. I've had a couple large series. Last year, I went through the book of Job, and then went through the book of Acts. Uh, So we've had some large series that we've gone through, and it was time for a topical series. I don't do lots of topical series Uh, but it's time to do something like that. We will still ground it inside of Texas Scripture because that's what we do here. We preach the Word and we ground things in theology. And so that's what we want to do with this community series to really show you the theology behind community. I can tell you what this is not going to be. This is not a series. You're going to walk away each week with five ways to make better friends. That's not what we're going to do. We're going to look at who God is. That's where we're going to start. We're going to look at who God is in relationship to who we are. We're going to look at who we are inside of Jesus Christ. We're going to see our position in Christ and how that relates us to other people and why that's important and how that connects us to God our Father. So we're going to see this from a different perspective, a theological perspective, and walk through the scriptures on the importance of community. So with that, open your Bibles this morning to John chapter 14. And I want to pray and ask God's blessing this morning upon the preaching of his word. Let's pray together today. Our Father, I thank you this morning for the chance we have to look into your word. Thank you for the way that your word instructs us, the way that your word teaches us, the way that your word builds our faith. Lord, we're aware that without faith is impossible to please you and that faith comes by hearing and hearing is by the word of God. And Lord, we know that it's the word that builds our faith. Help us to continue to be a church that preaches your word. Father, I'm thankful that we can look into the scriptures. I'm thankful that we can use the scriptures so we can study the scriptures together and see what you have for us. Help us to learn in this series. Help us to see connections to our lives. Help us to see connections to community and how you bring together a body of believers to help push us towards Christ. Lord, I pray that you would let this be a time where we evaluate our relationships, evaluate the communities that we're in, and use it in a way that's honoring to you and brings glory to Jesus. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said together, amen. I'll never forget rolling into our destination for vacation a few years ago. We went to Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And the drive was an absolute nightmare. My daughter was really young. My son wasn't much older than that. We thought we could still do these long road trips, and we were wrong. It was a terrible trip, but we finally made it. It was late at night. We got the lay of the land. We figured out the resort. We figured out where we needed to go uh, for different things. And we went to bed that night, and day number two comes for vacation. And oftentimes for us, day number two on vacation starts with going to a brunch restaurant. Anybody else love brunch? Can I get a raise of hand, an amen, a hallelujah, some kind of a Pentecostal sign this morning for brunch? Love brunch. It's good stuff. So we search Gatlinburg, there's got to be good breakfast restaurants, and man, we get on the internet, and there's just like this list of breakfast restaurants, stuff looks amazing, we finally land on one, it looked fantastic, it was this huge restaurant, this big building, it was close to our resort, and it looked something like that, just amazing, like a log cabin, big fireplace, tower on the inside. It was the same type of thing, wood floors, big rough hewn timbers, the support beams, and the servers all had jeans on and lumberjack shirts. Well, we're in for a treat. It's going to be fantastic. My fingers twitched with delight as I opened up the menu, hoping to find cheesy omelets and chorizo stuffed scrambles, you know, all the good stuff. And I opened the menu, and to my disappointment, it was just eggs, bacon, toast. Eggs, 
hash browns, pancakes. The most creative thing on the menu was a sausage shaped like a pig. I'm from Iowa. I don't need to be reminded where sausage comes from. The food came and I looked at my plate and I thought, this is such a way, what a disappointment. I paid this for this breakfast. I mean, it was like I cooked it myself and brought it into the place. It was just nothing. Now, you say, yeah, that's basic, though. Basic can be good. Yeah, this was not good basic. This was basic basic. And not the good kind of basic. It was just basic with a high price to it. It's horribly disappointing. And I walked away from that place and I looked back at the building. I'm like, yeah, it looks so amazing. The inside of it looks amazing. But I would say it like this. That place promised far more than it could deliver. It promised far more than it delivered. I was looking forward to an amazing breakfast there and left very disappointed. Bill and Pam moved to a new community. And Pam was excited because she had never really had the types of friendships and the type of community that she had hoped for. Yeah, she had some friends. She was involved in a small group. She had people to read the scriptures with. She had people who would pray for her and encourage her in her faith, but she never had, you know, like that type of friendship. The, the types of friendship that she saw on Facebook and social media of a group of gals that would travel to Texas to go visit Chip and Joanna Gaines. That's community. And touring wineries together and yeah, that's, that's what friendship looks like. Now, Pam just always wanted that type of friendship and always felt left out of it. You see, what Pam doesn't actually realize is that that type of friendship, what she's looking at, promises far more than it can deliver. Oftentimes, that type of friendship looks really good on the outside, it looks like the amazing breakfast restaurant, but it's completely shallow and disappointing on the inside. Listen, we have access to a sense of belonging. We have access to a sense of community in Christ that will never disappoint. We have access to the type of fellowship and belonging in our lives that will always deliver more than it promises. In fact, it'll always deliver exactly what it promises and never leave you disappointed. I want you to look at John 14 with me. And I love these verses. Just listen to the hope. Listen to the joy. Listen to the comfort in the words of these verses in John 14. John 14, verse 16 says, And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another counselor to be with you forever. Hear that? To be with you forever. That's community. If you look up the word community in the dictionary online, it, it says a sense of belonging. You, you don't have to think of community just as a group of people, but what is community? Community is a sense of belonging. It's a sense of fellowship. It's a sense of connectedness. When I read John 14, verse 16, I see that sense of connectedness. I will be with you forever. Listen to verse 18. I love how it says it here. I will not leave you as orphans, but I am coming to you. Look at verse 23. Jesus answered, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. These are beautiful promises that talk about the presence of God in our lives. The greatest sense of belonging, the greatest sense of community that we can ever experience to be known and to know our God and the creator of the universe. That's the source of true fellowship and true community. But as you look around the world, what we see is an epidemic of loneliness. Social media is a trick. Social media makes us feel like we have lots of friends. It's easy to make friends on social media. How many of you have crossed the thousand friend mark on Facebook? Let me see your hands. 
Okay, keep your hands up. You don't actually have a thousand friends, Brad. I'm just telling you that, okay? It looks like it, but you don't actually have a thousand friends. That's the trick of social media. It makes you feel like you're connected. In many ways, our world is more connected than it's ever been, but it's actually less connected than it's ever been because it makes you feel connected when you're actually not connected. And the other trick of the devil is to make you feel like you're missing out on true community because you look at everybody else's lives and you think, why don't I have that? And the funny thing is, is a lot of the people that you're looking at also are looking at other people thinking the same thing. Well, why don't I have friends like that? Why don't I have community like that? And we're all thinking that with each other. Why don't I have community like that? And everybody's thinking the same thing and longing and wishing for true community. There's been some studies done in our world recently. Duke University did a study and suggests that our society is in the midst of the most dramatic and progressive slide towards disconnection in history. Here's some stats for you. 27 million people in our world, in our country, live alone. More people say that they feel alone than at any other time in our nation's history. 25% of people say they have nobody to turn to as a confidant. More people in our world today link their depression to loneliness than ever before. And the number of socially isolated Americans has doubled since 1985. Not only are more people living alone, but they're becoming emotional lone rangers because our society pushes towards individualism. Everything's tailored to the individual. And Rick Warren summed it up so well, and he said this, isolation exists because we have a culture that feeds individualism. The fruit of rampant individualism in our culture is massive loneliness. And I would believe that's the case. And even in our chosen solitude, you see that people have the insatiable need for connection. How do you prove that? Give us two seconds of downtime. Watch people in a line in a store. What's the first thing they do when they're standing in a line with nothing to do? <sighs> Pull the phone out. Start to flip through social media and look for connection. There's a drive inside of our hearts for connection. Why do we all have that drive for community? Why would we all have that drive for a sense of belonging in our hearts? Why is that the case? I'll tell you why that's the case. It's because we image our Creator. Our Creator, our God, is a loving God. Our God lived in community from eternity past. Our God is in fellowship and always has been in fellowship. Our God is a relational God, and we are created in His image. Therefore, we bear that divine imprint on our souls to also be relational people that seek community. It's essential to who He is, and because we're created in His image, it's essential to who we are as well. I want you to walk with me this morning as we look at four essential truths about God and community. And like I said this morning, I want to root this in theology. I want us to see who God is because when we see who God is, when we know who God is, when we get a glimpse of who God is, we can better see ourselves. We know who we are when we have the right perspective of God. And so seeing God in the right light and through the right lenses helps us to have the right self-perception as well. So let's look at who God is and see how that relates to who we are. Four truths here this morning. The first one's the longest, so don't get worried. This one's going to go on for a long time. You're going to be like, there's three more. How's he going to fit this all in? Just trust me, it'll be okay. Number one's the longest. And here's the first one. God exists eternally in perfect community. God exists eternally in perfect community. What does this mean, that God existed eternally in perfect community? It means that God was always in fellowship, that God was always enjoying companionship. Let me tell you some other things it means. It means that God eternally rejoiced in who He is. It means that God was never lonely. It means that God did not create us because He needed friends. God did not create us because He needed companionship. God did not create us because He needed worship. In fact, God didn't create us because He needed anything. He didn't need anything at all. He was completely sufficient and self-sufficient and satisfied and enjoyed who He was in all of eternity. God always was. 
You want to give yourself a headache? Try to conceive of a being that always was. Try to conceive of God always being there. As far back as you can go, He's there. And He's satisfied. And He's enjoying who He is inside of Himself. Which implies the fact that there has to be not just one person, but multiple persons in the Godhead. And we do believe that there is one God. We are monotheists, but we also believe in a doctrine called the Trinity, which says that there is one God who eternally exists in three persons. And this is essential to who God is. Because John tells us in the book of 1 John that God is love. God is is love. That's describing the essential nature of who He is. He's made up of love. John chapter 3, verse 16, the most famous verse in all the Bible says, God so loved the world that He gave. I love hearing the young voices chime that one in there. That He gave. What does that tell us? God is love, and love by its very nature is out giving. It's out pouring. It goes out of itself to an object, which means that there had to have been separate persons in the Godhead. There could not have been just one person in the Godhead. If God is love, that means for all of eternity that God had to be pouring His love out on a destination, and we find in the Scriptures that God was eternally pouring His love out on Himself, on the persons of the Godhead, and there was perfect love and fellowship. Love has to have a destination, a person. Think about the most loving people that you know. They exist to make others feel loved and special. Think about even the differences in animals. Raise your hand this morning if you are a dog person. Raise your hand if you are a cat person. Okay, some of you are less apt to raise your hand except for Katie. Whip that right up, cat person. Dogs and cats even are different. We don't have any pets at our house. My son tried with a goldfish, two goldfish in nine months. Both went down into a watery grave. Didn't go so well, did it, bud? That's okay. So I'm just not speaking from experience. I'm speaking from what people said. Dogs are naturally loving creatures. Dogs make you, as the owner, feel like you're the center of the universe. You come home, and the dog is waiting, telling you that you're great, telling you that you're loved, telling you that you're the most important person in the world. Cats, on the other hand, are snobs. Cats live their lives for themselves. Cats don't care if you're around. Cats do their own thing. You come home, the cat does its own thing. Right? There's a difference even in how pets behave. And you see the essential nature of a dog is to outpour its love on someone else, to make someone else feel special. That's what love is. It's an outpouring of yourself onto somebody else. And so what that tells us is that if God is love, if that is who he is from eternity past, that means that he always had to have a place for that love to go, therefore showing that there has to be three persons in one God because there had to be somewhere, some place for that love to go. John 17, flip over couple chapters in your Bible. John 17. I preached an entire, entire sermon on this subject one time. We're not going to rehash it all, but just to review some things that are important for us to understand community. John 17. Listen to how love and glory and glorifying are all kind of combined together. Sometimes we get the wrong idea of glorifying. We say words like this, God exists to glorify himself. And sometimes when you hear that phrase, you're like, oh, that doesn't sound right. God's doing this for his own glory. He's all about his own glory. It kind of hits us the wrong way sometimes. But what does it actually mean that God does all things for his own glory, that he's all about showing his glory? We get a glimpse of it from John 17. Look with me at verse 24. It says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am so that they will see my glory. Here Jesus says, I want them to see my glory. This is obviously something he's doing in love. 
to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the world's foundation. We're seeing a little bit of the function inside the Godhead, the Trinity. Righteous Father, the world has not known you. However, I have known you, and they have known that you sent me. I made your name known to them so they will continue to make it known so that the love that you have loved me with may be in them and I may be in them. So you see this relationship. We see the tie between glorifying and loving, and here's the truth of it. What is the glory of God? The glory of God is the warmth of his light. It's the warmth of his love. It's the emanation of who he is. It's his loving nature flowing out from him. So for God to want to show his glory, for God to want to be glorified is the most loving thing he can do because what he's literally doing when he shows his glory is he's showing the warmth and the light of his love on his son and telling us, you need to be part of this, join, believe, and become in Christ through his cross and his salvation. That's what it means for God to show his glory, to be all about his own glory, is to show the light of his love and the light of who He is to His creation. And so we see this function inside the Trinity. We see the Father eternally loving the Son, and all through the Scriptures we see that is the key phrase. We don't see a lot of the Son loving the Father. We know that the Son loves the Father, but the key language in the Scriptures is that the Father loves the Son, and for all eternity the Father was pouring out His love on the Son, and what we find also from the Scriptures is God, the Father was pouring out His love on the Son through the means of the Holy Spirit, and so the Spirit is moving in that love. The Spirit is creating that love. The Spirit is the means by which God loves the Son, and then we're pulled into that because it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, that God pours His love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And so now we're joined into this love of the Godhead. Now you're sitting here thinking, this is way too deep for 9.30 in the morning, Pastor Mike. Well, just hang with me. Just hang with me. Let me try to illustrate this I used this a couple years ago in our uh, Sermon on the Trinity, but I think of like a fountain, a tiered fountain. When I think of a tiered fountain, there's only one tiered fountain that I ever think of. It's from my childhood. It's at this restaurant called Casa Bonita. How many of you love Casa Bonita? Let me see your hands. All right, good. I got a few of you there. Uh, this may not reopen after COVID. This would be one of the greatest, probably one of the top five tragedies of COVID is the closing down of Casa Bonita, in my opinion. Great place, huge tiered fountain out in the front of Casa Bonita. How does this illustrate what we're talking about? Let me show it to you like this. God the Father is like the source at the top, the structure, the pipeline that runs up through this fountain, and He's the first tier of that fountain. God the Father pours His love out and that love pours over the top tier into the second tier and that second tier is Jesus Christ. And so God is eternally pouring His love out and it's flowing over into Jesus Christ, and He's forever showing His pleasure and His joy in the Son. And how does He do that? What's the water? Well, in the illustration, what we find in the Scriptures, the water is like the Holy Spirit, and God is pouring His love out into the Son by means of the Holy Spirit. And guess what? We're brought into this relationship we're like the third tier in the fountain. We're brought into this relationship because we are joined with Christ. When you believe in Jesus for salvation and trust Him as your Savior, you are joined in with Jesus. Union with Christ. And therefore, because you're joined with Jesus, God pours His love out on the Son through the Holy Spirit. But because you are in Christ... You're the recipient of the Father's love as well. So that is how we're loved by the Father. We're loved by the Father because we are in Christ, and God pours His love out to the Son through the Spirit, and we're joined into Jesus, and so we are now the recipients of the love of the Father through the Spirit. Now hang with me. I'm getting, how does this relate to community? I'm getting there, okay? But we've got to root this in theology. So there's something here with the Spirit. The Spirit's very important because the Spirit is the means by which God pours out His love. The Spirit is how we're joined to Jesus. And when we're joined to Jesus, we're a recipient of the love of the Father. So it's all kind of connected here. So let's go to the next truth this morning. The next truth we need to see is this, that God created us to desire community 
And not just desire any kind of community, but desire community in Him. We desire community because we are image bearers of God. God did not just simply design us to desire any kind of community, not just general human community. He designed us to want to have a sense of belonging and fellowship in Him. In eternity past, the God had decided to create, again, not to have companions, not because He was lonely, but in order to show the glory of who He is to His creation. To let created beings enjoy the glory of who He was. And so He put within all of our hearts the desire to know Him and to be satisfied in Him. And friends, we are designed to find ultimate fulfillment of community only in Him by the community and the belonging that He provides. But how? How do we experience that? Well, it goes back to the function of the Trinity. So number three is this. We experience true community by loving and being loved by God in Christ through the Spirit. We experience true community by loving and being loved by God in Christ through the Spirit. And so the more we strengthen and live in the Spirit and sharpen the ministry of the Spirit in each other's lives, the more we experience Jesus and the more we experience the love of the Father. And so there's the joy that we get from that community through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I want you to look at John 14 again and just listen to some of these phrases from John 14 that imply, that indicate to us a sense of community from God. Look at verse 16. It says, I will ask the Father and He will give to you another counselor to be with you forever. To be with you. To give you that sense of belonging. That sense of love and community that we all desire. Look down at verse 18. I will not leave you as orphans, but I am coming to you. Verse 20, on that day you will know that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. See the in language? So Jesus is in God and we are in Jesus. And as a result of us being in Jesus, the love of the Father then pours out to us because Jesus is in God and we are in Jesus. And it's just all this big inside language and we're all contained inside of there. And that's the sense of community, the sense of joy and fulfillment that we experience. If you go on to the next verse, 21, at the end of 21, it says, And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I will also love him and will reveal myself to him. Verse 25, I have spoken these things to you while I remain with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all of these things. Verse 27, he says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. You've heard me tell you I'm going away and I'm coming to you. If you love me, you would rejoice that I'm going to the Father. So we have all these promises that Jesus is going to be with us. We're going to experience his presence. We're going to experience the fellowship of who he is. But there's some interesting language here in the text because Jesus says, I'm going, but I'm also coming. Jesus says, I'm leaving, but I'm coming to you at the same time. So we have almost contradictory language. And one of the disciples picked up on this. If you look with me at verse 22, I love how John says this. This disciple named Judas. You all remember a disciple named Judas? Most of us do. I like how John puts in parentheses here. Not Iscariot, by the way. (laughs) So there were two Judases. Or do you say Judais? I don't know. Two Judases. This is the not Iscariot one. This guy named Judas was picking up on the apparent contradiction of what Jesus was saying. So Judas says to him, Lord, how is it that you're going to reveal yourself to us, but not the world? Lord, how is it that you say you're going away, but you're coming to us at the same time? I'm not understanding how this is working. Jesus says, thank you, Judas, for that great question. Look how he answers in verse 23. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He's leaving, but he's coming at the same time. 
So how is it that Jesus left but then came at the same time? He comes in the form of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, it gives us the presence. The Holy Spirit is sometimes called the Spirit of Christ. We're joined into the Godhead through the Holy Spirit. Look as it says in verse 17 in this chapter, 14, 17. He is the Spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive Him because it doesn't see Him or know Him, but you do know Him because He remains with you, and soon He will be, what's the word? In you. Jesus promises, I'm going away, but I'm sending somebody else. And it's through him that you'll experience my presence. And guess what? He's not just going to be with you anymore. He's going to be inside of you. And in my Bible, I have that circled. The word in is circled up here. And over here on verse 23, I have the word home circled. And I, I drew this little line between. I, I used a ruler. I don't like squiggly lines. I drew a line between those two things because I think that's connected. The Holy Spirit will be in you. God will make his home with you through the Spirit. So Jesus is present with us in the Holy Spirit. And so it's through the Spirit that we enjoy the presence of Christ, that we're in Christ, and because we're in Christ, we experience the love of the Father and the community of the Father in our lives. Let's take this one step further. Number four this morning, the Spirit stirs up love and obedience as a result of true community with God. And so these ideas of love and community are also tied into community, or excuse me, love and obedience are tied into community. There's a sense in which it all works together. I want you to look with me at this chapter, verse 15. We have these indications of these words here. It says in verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commands. And so love and keeping God's commands are tied together, and it's tied together inside the Holy Spirit. So there's a sense in which the Spirit prompts us to love and keep His commands, and there's a sense in which loving and keeping His commands stirs up the Spirit. It's kind of a, a, a relationship between those things. Look at verse 21, it says, the one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. Verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. So it sounds as if you must obey and love God if he's going to come and be with you. It sounds like that. But let me just explain in a second here how this love works. Look at verse 24, it says, he the one who does not love me will not keep my words. The word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. So what is this kind of love? It sounds like, kind of sounds like, you love and keep God's commands in order to gain favor with Him. Now, I'm, I want to tell you this morning, that is not what's happening. That is not what's happening here. This is not the kind of love that's a legalistic love. What he's not saying is if you want the presence of God, then obey this list, just give me the checklist, and as long as I'm obeying the checklist, then I can experience the love of the Father. That's not what it's saying here. There's, there's a connection between loving and obeying God. They're almost one and the same. There's different ways we use language like this. There's a friend of mine, a number of years ago, he, he was telling me about his dad. His dad was declining in health. And we were sitting there chatting, and he says, let me just tell you, he goes, when you're young, you never imagine your dad getting older to the point where he needs care. When you're young, you never imagine that there will be a time where you have to help your dad use a bedpan. You never imagine that. He says, let me tell you what, it is a weird experience. But he did it. Now, I can tell you this. My friend didn't come to me and say, I loved helping my dad with a bedpan. He did not say that. What he did say was, I helped my dad because of love. That's not exactly the type of love we're talking about here in this text. It's not like God gives us commands and we say, well, you know, Jesus did die for me and all, and he went through all that stuff, so I guess I, I, guess I can obey because he, you know, so out of love I'm going to do it. That's not what it is. It's more like a love. I love to do his commands, and I do his commands out of love. There's a relationship between those two things. Let me illustrate it like this. The other day, I obeyed a command that was given to me by my five-year-old daughter, Zoe. Now, now, she tries to give me lots of commands. She, she tries to boss her brothers around all the time as well. All the time. She gave me a command the other day. And I listened to her. And I obeyed her command. Here's what she said. Dad, 
let's play Candyland. Yes, we got a fan of Candyland out there. I said, yes, ma'am, let's play Candyland. Now, I can tell you that Candyland is not one of my favorite games. I do not get together with groups of people on Friday nights and put the kids to bed and say, all right, let's get the Candyland out, <laughs> right? We're not doing that. Candyland's not on my top 10 list. It's number 11, but it's not on my top 10 list. But I can tell you this, I absolutely loved obeying that command. Why? Because of how it connected me with my daughter. Was the game my first choice? Probably not. But the connection with her was special. I would do that any day of the week. I love just sitting there, moving the pieces, turning the cards over, helping to explain how it's going to work. I love the fact that the game ended and I won. <laughs> I was really proud of myself. I loved it. It was great. I love the fact that after I won, she said, close your eyes, Dad. I closed my eyes. She said, oh, open them up. I opened it up and she had switched our pieces. She said, there, I won. I fixed it. <laughs> like, all right, honey, whatever you want. I see what we're raising. Raising a Bill Belichick and Tom Brady right here. It's called a cheater, but <laughs> that's what we're raising. It was cute. But it connected me. You know, it's like, that's not my first choice. But I loved, I loved to do it because it connected me. So when you see this language here in the text, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commands. It's not like God gives these commands and you're like, oh, these Think. Oh, but because I love him. No, it's not like that. I love him. I keep his commands because when I keep his commands, it stirs up love in me for him. And it may not be always your first choice. God says, don't live together before you're married. I don't know about that. That's not what people are doing today. It's kind of old-fashioned. Really? No, listen to it. Obey it may not be your first choice, but what's going to happen when you obey it is it's going to join you to your father in a special way. It's going to increase the love of your father because he has your best interest at heart. He wants what's best for you. He loves you, and how to love you, obey him. So how do we bring all this together? The function of the Trinity, how we're loved in God through Christ and the Spirit, how we obey his commands, how, how, how do we bring this all together? There, there's a, a real strong connection between loving God, keeping his commands. How do we bring this all together? Where does community fit in? Well, as I look at community in the world, I see that the world can do community. I see that the world can have friendships. I see that the world can have connections with each other. There is a worldly sense of community that's based on connections, that's based on commonality. But let me just tell you, the world's friendships will never be complete. The world's friendships can never be ultimately satisfying because Christ is missing out of the world's friendships. And sometimes as churches, we take our cues from the world. We build communities around commonality. We build communities about things that we have in common, similar life experience like singles or newlyweds or professionals or schools. We build community around identity. There's cowboy churches out there. There's motorcycle churches out there. Some of you are on the internet right now. I've got to find me one of these motorcycle churches. We build community around commonality. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's a sense in which it's always going to be like that. We will find people that we share common interests with. That's going to happen. But that's not ultimate. That's really just taking a cue from the world. And you'll never find ultimate satisfaction from those types of friendships. It will always promise more than it can deliver if it's void of Christ. The world's friendships fall short. True Christian community takes another step, and I want you to see the big idea this morning. This is going to be for the rest of the series. This is where we're going to probe into for the next eight weeks is this, that true community is that which stirs our obedience and our affections for Christ. That's where we're going to find true community. True community stirs our affections and obedience for Christ. You do not need commonality with people. 
you do not need to both ride motorcycles in order to find this kind of community. You do not need those types of worldly friendships to find this type of community. This type of community transcends all of those things. This type of community fulfills what the Scripture says, that in the body of Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, nor slave nor free, or male or female, that we're all in Christ. And in Christ, true community can happen, and true community is when we push one another towards love and obedience to Christ in the Holy Spirit. True community is when we stir the Spirit up inside of one another towards loving and obeying Christ because we are loved by God in Christ through the means of the Holy Spirit, and so the more we stir the Spirit, the more we're connected in Christ, and that's the purpose of community is to push us towards stirring the Spirit for love and affection towards Jesus Christ. I'll never forget on a road trip years ago, driving through Nevada, there are not many places to stop in the middle of Nevada. And so we found a town called Winnemucca. Maybe some of you have been there. And we found a hotel, and there are not very many hotels in Winnemucca. Therefore, they can charge as much as they want to. I am at my heart a cheapskate. I still paid too much, but it was the only place I could find. We rolled in, and my worst suspicions were confirmed. This was a dump that I had just paid a lot of money for. Strike one, there was a casino attached to the hotel. Now you're looking at me, you're saying, oh, that's not too bad, right? MGM Grand, Bellagio. No, 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 no. This was not MGM Bellagio. This was like a hotel where they stuffed a casino inside the breakfast area. You know, that type of thing. Strike one. Strike two. There were ashtrays in the elevator. I understand people smoke, but listen, there is a limited amount of oxygen in an elevator. I don't want smoking in an elevator. Strike number three, we come to the room of the hotel. My son was really young. He had been cooped up in the car. He needed to run around. We got him out of the car. We took his shoes and socks off, let him run around the room for a long time. He jumps up onto the bed, flips his feet up like this, and we look at the soles of his feet, and they are black from the grime on the carpet. This place was a winner. If you're wondering, I'll give you the name of it later if you want to stay there sometime. <laughs> so we just kind of huddled together, just tried to not think about it, left the next day to go find a breakfast place. And I left that, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, what are we going to find for a breakfast place? I mean, this is, this is going to be bad. I, I was very suspicious of any place we're going to find for breakfast. So we found a place that was close to the hotel. It was this little place called The Griddle. I mean, it just didn't look very impressive from the outside. In fact, I think, I'm not for sure about this, but I think that used to be a pizza hut. <laughs> That's a big red flag, all right? Any restaurant that used to be a pizza hut, stay away, unless it's the Drake Jethro's, okay? That's the only one that I know of that's good. I think it used to be a pizza hut. Walk in there, it's a very simple place, simply decorated, nothing special. Like, we just need to get breakfast and get out of here. Open up the menu, and what to my wondering eyes would appear but cheesy omelets <laughs> and chorizo stuffed scrambles. Oh, my goodness. Everything was homemade. They had salsas and sauces all homemade from there. It was amazing. It was one of the best breakfasts I had ever had. And the outer shell of the place, the inside of it, was not impressive at all. You know what? This place delivered far more than it promised. Delivered far more than it promised. And such is community, such is our friendships. Too often we find ourselves looking on social media, seeing all the things we think we're missing out on. We're watching groups of friends go to girls' nights out and travel together. We're like, oh my goodness, I wish I could have that. That's the kind of community I want. And really what we're looking at is we're looking at the nice, giant breakfast restaurant in Gatlinburg, Tennessee that boasted of a lot but was very disappointing on the inside. And instead, what we need is the simple, the griddle, the simple experience of people gathered together in a small group around God's Word 
to ask one another questions. Like, what's the Lord been teaching in His Word recently? How can I pray for you? What's on your heart that you can share with me today? Just the simple experience of being together with other believers around the Word of God, stirring up the Spirit of God so that you can experience the love of the Father in Jesus Christ and reflect the love of the Trinity, of the God of whom we were created in His image. It's beautiful.